Good evening, everyone. I'm Colin Lynch with Sunnybrook's Board of Directors, and tonight I'm pleased to offer the introductions for our annual discussion on type 2 diabetes. This is our final discussion for 2020, but rest assured that we have many great lectures planned for the new year. Please consider joining our mailing list to learn about upcoming topics. You can also access upcoming lecture information on the speaker series website, where you have access this evening's talk. We'll continue bringing you the speaker series in an online format for the foreseeable future to ensure the safety of you and also our staff. Many of you watching may be living with diabetes or have a friend or loved one who is affected by this condition. Diabetes can affect people of all ages, but type 2 diabetes more commonly affects those over the age of 40. According to Diabetes Canada, 90% of Canadians with this chronic condition are living with type 2 diabetes. Thankfully, our panel of experts is here to offer some important guidance and suggestions. You'll soon hear more about how to manage diabetes in this time of COVID-19, what foods you should be adding to your plates, as well as an important look at finding happiness when you have a chronic illness. We hope the information you learned tonight resonates and helps during what has become a most unusual and difficult year. To get things started, I'd like to now introduce tonight's moderator, Walter Leahy. Walter is an occupational therapist and graduated from Dalhousie University in 1995. Since that time, he's worked in a variety of clinical settings in Canada, the United States, and Ireland, holding clinical program development and management positions. His clinical focus is on patients over the age of 65 with complex medical concerns that are complicated by social determinants of health, like addictions and financial difficulties. Currently, he is executive director of the Sunnybrook Academic Family Health Team. We are fortunate to have Walter guiding us through tonight's session. Thank you so much, Walter, and I'll pass the microphone over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Colin, and I'd like to welcome, uh, good evening to everyone who, um, who are joining us uh, remotely this evening. Uh, I think probably in a, at a different time, we'd all be in a room with a couple of hundred people, uh, but we're living during interesting times. So, um, so we'd like to thank you for uh, taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, tonight, our lecture is called Diabetes Update, uh, Enhancing Your Health and Happiness. And we're, we're really lucky to have a great lineup of speakers um, who will, I think, will walk us through some very interesting topics um, in, in this area. Um, Lee Kaplan, uh, one of our uh, diabetes nurse educators, will get us started with a really important presentation uh, on finding happiness when dealing with ongoing health issues. Um, followed by Jill Zweig, who will then discuss some beneficial foods you should consider adding to your diet. And then we also have uh, Dr. Jeremy Gilbert, who will speak uh, about a topic that is really especially timely, uh, managing diabetes uh, during this pandemic, during COVID-19. We've set some time aside for a question and answer session. Um, uh, later on this evening, after our uh, uh, panelists have given their presentations, we want to thank everyone already who uh, who provided questions online, and I can see them in the chat box already. Um, and of course, you know, feel free to add to ask questions along the way as the presenters are uh, are, are speaking this evening. Um, and so, really, we might not be able to get to every question, but we'll do our very best uh, to try and answer as many questions as we can. Um, so to begin the lectures, I'll introduce our first speaker, and that is uh, Lee Kaplan. Uh, and as I mentioned, she's our she's been with uh, with the Sunnybrook Family Health Team for a number of years uh, as a diabetes nurse educator, and she brings really a wealth of experience and knowledge um, uh, in relation to diabetes. So we're very glad she's here to provide some guidance on finding happiness uh, when you have a chronic illness. So without further ado. I'll pass the uh, virtual microphone over to Lee. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. And uh, tonight, as it's been said, I'm going to talk to you about finding happiness when you have a chronic illness such as diabetes. I will present some evidence and we can explore it together. And I'll end with some strategies that might be you might be interested in trying. So why this topic? Well, you know, in the COVID times, I started thinking, 
and looked up happiness and what it meant. And there was so much, it's a hot topic. There's so much information out there. There's books, the Dalai Lama's writing a book. There's um, the equi happiness equation. There's a lot of, um, from different experts. And a lot of these, re these books have come from research in this topic. So why did I think about this with diabetes? Well, I started to look back at some studies that had been done, um, which is one of them was the Diabetes Attitude, Wishes and Needs second study, which was administered over 6,000 individuals. 8,596 were people living with diabetes. It ran in 17 different countries. And it did show when looking at people with diabetes showed that there was an emotional, emotional and physical well-being issues. And these are some of the issues that people were seeing is that self-management skills were less than optimal when emotional issues were present. There were people were experiencing fear and anxiety, worry about hypoglycemia if they were on insulin or some oral hypoglycemic agents. The, the worry of complications and depression, a feeling of hopelessness for some and discrimination from having diabetes. What I think was positive here was there is some outlooks that can bring about uh, some changes by looking at different strategies for coping. And one of them being the support from others. So then I explored further was you know, we know about depression being, and it's not a it's, a, it's a population with people with diabetes who have depression, but there also appeared to be a topic called diabetes distress. This has been around since 1995, and it sometimes gets overlooked that when we've got so much physical, the physiological aspects of diabetes, we tend to sometimes forget about the emotional side of just living with a chronic condition like diabetes, that the worries, worries and the fears and the demand of this condition. It's estimated that 36% of people with type two and 42.4% of type, people with type one experience some distress at some point in their lives in living with diabetes. So then I thought, could diabetes and happiness, can they coexist? Is this possible? I start to wonder if people who suffer from diabetes distress, if they were happier, would this improve their health? So I started to explore positive psychology, which came around in the beginning of 2000 with Dr. Segelman. And he was, uh, he thought in the 1990s that Psychology primarily considered the issues of healing and damage repair and pointed out that there's attributes like hope and wellness and, and wisdom and encouragement that we're totally ignoring. And so that is how positive psychology was born in looking at some, getting some research done on the positive aspects of life. So happiness involves feel three categories, feeling of joy and pleasure, um, a sense of well-being and purpose in your life. And then there also is an evaluative well-being where we look at the quality of one's life, the goodness of one's life. This research um, is rapidly developing on health and happiness. In Andrew's Steptoe's article on happiness and health. He stated that happiness and linking it with health involves looking at lifestyle factors, exercise and diet, and biological processes. He says that the intervention has yet to show substantial sustained improvement in subject, subjective well-being, but the field showed great promise. So do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There might be something here around happiness and well-being. They actually in 2018 had an inaugural summit on happiness science in healthcare, looking into stakeholders' roles. 
So there might be something here. So let's explore. When we, when I started to look at it, when thinking about it with diabetes, there was a recent um, new research article in November 2018, which was referred to as a well-being intervention for individuals with diabetes, a systematic review. This involved looking at 34 articles. It showed that depression improved in 14 of the 19 studies, which focused on mindfulness intervention. There is an issue that only four of the studies were rated as high quality and most studies had small sample sizes of less, less than 50. It's, it's thought that well-being intervention have potential to improve psychological and medical outcomes in patients with diabetes as listed on this slide. Right now, the literature does not support a specific intervention. And there was a lot of variability in the studies and, and what they were studying. So what's it showing is that within the area of happiness and well-being and focusing on diabetes, we need to look for more rigor, rigorous, controlled, and well-powered studies to see if well-being can truly impact function and diabetes outcome. But what's interesting for me around this diabetes and wellness is that it can be used by any individual. It, it's thought to promote motivation and self-efficacy, which hopefully would improve self-management. And it doesn't cost very much or require extensive training. So happiness, seems like it could be something that might be important. So I started to look at the brain and think about how does our brain work and what does it have to do with happiness? And what was found was in Dr. Suit's book, uh, The Mayo Clinic Handbook on Happiness, a four-step plan for resilience living, he said that the brain weighs about three pounds, it has billions of nerves, and it's complex but it has a simple design. He said our brains are always doing something even when we're doing nothing. He called these modes the default mode and the focus mode. The default mode might be referred to as the wandering mode. I'm wondering if you've ever found that you drive home and wonder how you got there. Have you ever gone into the kitchen and wonder what you went into the kitchen for? Have you ever listened to a talk and your mind starts to wander. These are all normal parts of the default mode, which actually we spend 50% of our time in. The, the issue with this is that the mo being in this mode is usually it's neutral feelings or thoughts, or they can tend to be negative. It is a great piece because it connects us with the outside. So we can look back into our past or we can look into our future of what are we gonna eat for dinner tonight? But it doesn't tend to, to make us happy. What was found was the focus mode tends to make, has been found to make us happy. And this, you might've noticed it when you all of a sudden realize the day's gone by and you don't know where it went. You're out for a walk and you lose track of time. You spend fr time with friends on a Zoom dinner and time just flies by. You're in the focus mode. And this mode has been shown that people tend to be happier in this mode. So how do we get ourselves in the focus mode more often? And the thought is by a lot of uh, Dr. Laura Santos out of Yale, and Dr. Suit um, have shown that and said that actually practicing some of these strategies can be helpful in making us happier. But I think we need to remember that happy, happiness is not by chance, it's by choice. We need to make the effort to try things. If it was easy as me saying, be happy, then every, we wouldn't be talking about this and people wouldn't be writing so many books. When in fact, for a lot of people, it might feel like you're pushing a boulder up a hill when I talk about being happy.
So when we're discussing these different strategies, I want to first focus on mindful or mindful. Um, and then you can see the differences of the mind. What we want is where the dog's at and a clearer head. Um, mindfulness has been, it's, uh, as I said, out of the 14, 19 studies, it showed um, improvement from depression. It is something that uh, I think with all of the strategies I'm going to share with you, is that something that we should try to be is in the moment and being present. I would encourage you that these strategies that we'll be discussing will require to you to, to take some time to do them. It could be as little as two minutes to maybe five as you're starting these activities. I haven't listed these strategies as one, two, three, four, five, because one thing what the research showed was that when people are looking for happiness, the strategy they choose, if they like it, they seem to be happier. So I think that that comes back down to your choice. So one of the healthiest practices we should improve on is the exercise strategy. There was a study in 2000 with people who had depression and they looked at two arms where they looked at exercising for 30 minutes, three times a day, three times a week, sorry, three times a day is a lot, three times a week. And we looked at medication. What they found was there was improvement with medication, but by 10 weeks, 90% of the exercise arm saw benefit in being happier. It's also what's nice about exercise, and I noticed uh, someone was asking about Alzheimer's, is that this actually has been shown to improve cognitive function both in youth and children and also in older adults. So there is some benefit for our brains and for our bodies in producing uh, well-being. One of the biggest studies that Dr. Uh, Martin Selgeman was that they studied was random act of kindness. And they showed more increase in well-being than any other exercise when this was tested. There's a few different ways to perform random acts of kindness. You can pave it, pave it forward by paying for someone's coffee in, in the line at Tim, Tim Hortons. The suggestion has been, uh, Dr. Laura Santos was sharing some research on her, in her study, her course on science of well-being, where she showed that if you did five acts of random, of random acts of kindness throughout a week, or you did it all in one day, there was more benefit for happiness with that. It also showed that money didn't matter, that there was a psychologist who did a study where they looked at paying people $5 or $20 uh, to do either a random act of kindness or go and get a coffee themselves. They asked them ahead of time, and everyone said, well, of course, $20, and if I do it for myself, I'm going to be happier. When in fact, what they found was it didn't matter about the amount of money that actually, and people were more happy when they were helping others. Another one, which in this time, which uh, Neil Pasricka book on happiness, the happiness equation, he reported on research to be completely engaged is to be fulfilled. So that some leaders, when they're completely on topic, on their project, but they also need time to disengage completely too. How do we go about doing this in this time of COVID? It could be that after you know dinner, you turn off your phone. That maybe if you're going for a walk, you don't carry your phone with you. You don't answer emails as you're doing that. That can be where you might be more present um, in the other activities you're doing and spending more time with family or friend, family um, on Zoom or at dinner, at the dinner table. Meditation, and this is where mindfulness has played a big role. Uh, people who practice this overall feel a sense of well being. I would say to you that it only, it could be one to two minutes. It doesn't have to be 
fully in meditation. It could be just focusing on your breath and taking a few moments to notice as you close your eyes, how your breath goes in through your nose, fills your stomach and your, your lungs, and then you release it. That amount of focusing can actually be a part that actually people have found to be helpful. I added on here was the Headspace. It's an app that actually does have a free app to it. It might be something that is worth exploring if you find your default mode of your brain constantly causing you to come out. They help you focus on that. The gratitude. This can keep take your mind out of negative uh, thinking. Gratitude can be thinking of five people who are important in your life or thinking of five things you're grateful for today. I would challenge you to write them down. When Dr. Suit talks about this in his book, he actually talks about thinking of that person, seeing them smile, and then writing their name down. What's nice about writing things down is it takes you back to things. You remember happy times, and that can, has been shown to make us happier. Savoring strategy. This is stepping out of your experience, keeping yourself in the moment, and it, it can actually help increase um, gratitude too. So for some people, it might be if you're a foodie, you might be looking at your meal and thinking, you know, oh, I'm noticing the tastes and the smells. I think of savoring, when you think of savoring, it's thinking of your five senses. When you look at your meal, your plate, can you taste it? Can you feel it? What do you hear when you're chewing on that potato? Um, those kinds of things can take you farther into it. Uh, there have been things where people will just think of a moment that in time, going for a walk, think about it, write it down, take a picture of it. And then what's really important with this is tell somebody about it. So if you write it down and tell someone about it, you're more likely to have even more moments to savor this thought. And one that I think is really critical now, but I think is important at all times, is a social connection strategy, where Nicol Nicholas Epley from the University of Chicago, who's a psycho uh, social psychologist, he did research on people on trains and found that actually they um, tend to uh, ignore people, but when they actually tested them and actually had them engage with people, they were happier. So he's suggesting that this is important, especially in the COVID time. So I've given you some strategies and you might be saying to yourself, come on, inner peace, I don't have all day. This is going to take some time. As I said, in summary, the research has no specific intervention has shown to improve happiness or well-being for people with diabetes as of yet. But the research is showing potential. I have shared with you some strategies. Remember, it's your choice to explore happiness as an option. It can take as little as two to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lee, for really a great presentation, uh, really on some holistic and, and practical strategies for uh, finding happiness, um, living with a chronic illness. And, you know, as you mentioned, it's, you know, there's, there really is, I mean, there's, there's a number of strategies and you talked about mindfulness and exercise and, and uh, meditation and savoring the moment and random acts of kindness. And so, so many of these things that I, I guess it's, Kind of like maybe building a muscle too that you know we can incorporate those into our daily lives and find the things that really work uh, for us or for individuals so it's um so really and probably all the more important now where we you know where we all should be taking care of ourselves you know because we're all out of our regular routines we're out of our um our comfort zones because really uh, of the, the the current external stress of the deck. so really um i think informative uh, and practical information. Um, 
so, uh, so thank you very much, Lee. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our uh, second speaker, uh, Jill Zweig, who is a registered dietitian and diabetes nurse educator uh, with the Sunnybrook Family Health Team with the Sun Deck Program. Um, she will be discussing superfoods to, to, to really try today um, and, and how that can improve um, health and well-being. So, uh, Jill, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, so my talk is titled, is titled Superfoods to Try Today. And my topic this evening was inspired oops, by an article that I read from the Harvard School of Public Health, and it was titled Superfoods or Super Hype. And the article caught my attention because it stated the following. There is no shortage of information and opinions on what foods are. Superfoods, power foods, and the top 10 foods to eat for health. Did these titles catch your attention? Well, obviously they caught my attention and I wanted to investigate more. The idea of a superfood is sure to sound appealing, especially if it promotes improving your health. Let's be honest. Who doesn't want to improve their health? We imagine a powerful food with special abilities like helping with weight loss or healing diseases such as diabetes. A food is generally promoted as a superfood when it offers abilities like weight loss or healing. A food is generally promoted as a superfood when it has a reasonable level of nutrients or is linked to the prevention of disease. But some questions to think about. Is this a food or some of the nutrients in a food that it is linked to disease prevention? Can other foods have the same nutrients in them? Have you thought about foods in a different way? What foods to eat daily, weekly, or even ones to limit to monthly? Maybe that's what we should be thinking about, creating a pattern or style of eating instead of what a superfood is. When I investigated the term superfood, I found that there is actually no scientifically based definition. But here are some definitions that I found. Wikipedia, superfood is a marketing term for food assumed to confer health benefits resulting from an exceptional nutrient density. The term is not commonly used by experts, dietitians, and nutrition scientists, many of whom dispute that particular foods have the health benefits claimed by their advocates. The second definition is from our well-trusted Webster's Dictionary. Superfood, plural, superfoods, noun. A food such as salmon, broccoli, or blueberries that is rich in compounds such as antioxidants, fiber, or fatty acids, considered beneficial to a person's health. Here are some common superfoods that are promoted. Broccoli, a source of vitamin A, C, and E, high in fiber. Garlic, a source of vitamin C, full of antioxidants. Blueberries, antioxidants, high in fiber. Kale, packed with vitamins, mullet, millet, uh, gluten-free and a natural source of iron. Many think of salmon, broccoli or blueberries as superfoods. In fact, we just saw these foods listed in the Webster's Dictionary definition. These foods are rich in popular compounds like antioxidants and fiber. These compounds can be beneficial to a person's health. But what makes it better than another food with similar nutritional qualities? What makes a superfood and where did this term originate? From what I could find, the earliest example of a superfood dates back to the 20th century. It was used as part of a marketing strategy. The United Fruit Company initiated an advertising campaign to promote the major, major import of bananas. The company published an informational pamphlet that included points about bananas and their nutritional value. 
the company advertised bananas as being cheap, nutritious, easily digested, available everywhere, and packaged by nature in germ-proof packaging, the skin. They suggested adding bananas to cereals, salads, and fried with meat. The term then became popular when physicians endorsed eating bananas in medical journals, publishing their findings that banana diets could be used to treat conditions like celiac disease and even diabetes. Bananas then developed a reputation of promoting health. The United Fruit Company included these health benefits in their promotional materials. And you can see some of the advertising that they used on my slide. In our current world with advertising on TV, print media, now internet and social media, information, or shall we say marketing of superfoods can spread at viral speeds. Anything marketed or advertised as a superfood now translates into super sales and this can easily create a billion dollar industry. Here is an example. The New York Times advertises this book as a bestseller. So it's the superfoods book on the right hand side of my screen, written by Dr. Stephen Pratt. And this book claims that these 14 foods can change your life, promoting the belief that by eating just 14 single foods, you can actually stop the incremental deteriorations that lead to common ailments and diseases. I think all healthcare professionals wish it was just that easy. The book goes on to say that beans can reduce obesity, blueberries can lower risk for cardiovascular disease, broccoli lowers incidence of cataracts, oats reduce the risk of type two diabetes, oranges prevent strokes, pumpkins lower risk of various cancers, wild salmon lowers the risk of heart disease, soy can lower cholesterol, spinach decreases chance of cardiovascular disease, and age-related macular degeneration. Tea helps prevent osteoporosis. Tomatoes can raise the skin's sun protection factor. Turkey helps build strong immune systems. Walnuts reduce the risk of developing coronary heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. And yogurt promotes strong bones and healthy heart. As I mentioned earlier, what is it about the specific food? Or rather, is it this just marketing and other foods can provide similar benefits? The book goes on to prescribe recipes by a chef by the name of Michael Strute of the Golden Door Spa. And it teaches you how to incorporate superfoods and their sidekicks into your diet. It also promotes this prescription that if these certain foods are eaten, they can be an indispensable guide to a healthy, long and energetic life. As you can see from all the magazine covers, the term superfood is used quite often in marketing. Blueberries have been commonly categorized as a superfood. Their popularity peaked in the early 90s. In 1991, a rating scale called the Oxygen Radical Absorbance Capacity, created by a scientist at Tufts University, ranked blueberries as number one on the scale, indicating that they were highest in antioxidant activity. Antioxidants have been proven to be beneficial in reducing oxidative stress, which may help with blood pressure, diabetes, weight manage, and reducing LDL cholesterol. Blueberries were no longer just a tasty treat or part of a balanced diet. Blueberries would become known as cancer fighters inflammation reducers, cognitive function defenders, and thus a superfood was born. Interestingly, the science behind this claim is weak. 20 years later, in 2011, the USDA retracted the information and removed the oxygen radical absorbance capacity database. It is now known that antioxidants have many functions related to health and many foods are a good, great source of antioxidants, such as strawberries, raspberries, kale, 
and artichokes, as well as blueberries. Despite the retraction, blueberries have continued to be promoted as a superfood. Look at how marketing can play with you. Are these products which may contain a superfood considered superfoods as well? The Rice Krispies claim that they're made with real strawberries. Does that make Rice Krispie squares made with strawberries a superfood? What about chocolate covered blueberries, acai berries or pomegranate seeds? These veggie straws appear to contain vegetables. But when you read the ingredients, as you can see on the label, potato starch, potato flour, expeller pressed canola oil and or sunflower oil and or sunflower oil, spinach powder, tomato paste, salt, cane sugar, cornstarch, potassium chloride, turmeric color, beetroot powder, sea salt. You can see that there are actually no vegetables in this product, but look, there's turmeric color. The same is true of the chocolate covered blueberry acai or pomegranate snacks. The fruit name comes from fruit juice concentrate. Is that a superfood? According to a Nielsen study, consumers are willing to pay more for foods that are perceived as healthy, especially if they have health claims on the labels. People often view food as medicine and people want to eat certain foods that they believe can prevent certain health problems such as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. In a 2015 Mintel research study, and Mintel is a global new products database, it showed a 36% increase globally in the number of foods and beverages launched with labels containing the word, quote, superfood, super in it, superfood, superfruit, super grain. Mintel Global New Products Database revealed that between 2011 and 2015, there was a phenomenal increase globally, over 200% in the number of new products, food and drink, both launched containing the word superfood, superfruit, or super grain. The following saw constant growth due to marketing since 2017. You may be familiar with some of these foods that have grown in popularity. Foods such as quinoa, the term ancient grains, chia seeds, kale, seaweed, ginger, turmeric, as we saw in the veggie sticks, turmeric color, oats, matcha, barley, and chickpeas. In fact, we now have cookies and cakes made from chickpea flour and snack bars with ginger and turmeric. What about the matcha? The reality is there is no one superfood that can offer all the nutrition and health benefits or energy that we need to nourish our bodies. Canada's food guide was recently updated in 2018. This guide, as well as other global studies have decided to focus on promoting healthy eating patterns or styles rather than focusing on the magic of one single food or single nutrient or quote, superfood. Scientific research does show that healthy dietary patterns such as the Mediterranean style of eating or the DASH dietary guidelines can improve health by reducing risk of developing a chronic disease or help improve outcomes for people with a chronic disease. The foods on the top, I call them the daily foods, by eating whole grains, eating fruits and vegetables, legumes and nuts. These foods are to be included in a healthy style of eating daily. The foods in the middle are maybe to limit to more occasionally. These foods may be looked at as more weekly or monthly. Things like sweets with more added sugar, refined or white grains, and high fat meats. If these foods are not in your diet regularly, you don't necessarily have to increase them or include them. On the bottom, things like eggs, 
or coffee can be used appropriately depending on how you eat them, how much, and maybe what they're paired with. For example, if you, chew fry, if you choose fried eggs regularly with bacon and fried potatoes, that may be something you want to limit to more monthly. But if you choose an egg scrambled on a no-stick pan with lots of vegetables added and maybe a slice of whole grain toast, that may be something that you can include more regularly or even daily. The same can be said for coffee. Regular coffee, decaf coffee with a little bit of low fat milk is something that could be included daily. But certainly some of those co fancy coffees from Starbucks or Tim Hortons, um, lattes with lots of flavoring in them, uh, matcha cappuccinos, um, and of course an ice cap maybe things that you want to limit to more weekly or even monthly. Let's take a look at the research behind the Mediterranean style of eating. There was a landmark study called the PREDIMED study, it stands for Primary Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease with a Mediterranean Diet. This study was conducted in Spain it started in 2003 and it ended in 2011. It's a landmark study, which means we still refer to it today, even though it was started almost 20 years ago. And it was designed to assess the long-term effects of, cardio of the Mediterranean diet. The outcomes looked at the overall incidence of cardiovascular disease in high-risk populations and individuals. The study was designed as a multi-center study, meaning that the data was collected from many countries around the world. There was almost 7,500 participants and 3,600 participants in the study already had type two diabetes. Both males and females were included between the age of 55 to 80. At the time of enrollment, no participants had cardiovascular disease, but as I mentioned, many had type two diabetes. The participants may have had um, high blood pressure, cholesterol, or struggled with weight. The participants were randomly assigned to one of three groups. The first group was a Mediterranean diet supplemented with mixed nuts. And as you can see on the slide, about 30 grams per day. So that would be about 15 walnuts. The second group was Mediterranean diet supplemented with extra virgin olive oil, four tablespoons per day. And the third group was just asked to follow a low fat diet based on American Heart Association guidelines. There were no calorie restrictions on any participants. Note that both the study groups contained higher fat content, but the fats used in both study groups was what we would consider to be vegetable-based or healthy types of fats. The study was stopped early in 2011 instead of 2013. It was supposed to be a 10-year study because as you can see on the graph, very early on, we began to see the health benefits. When looking at the graph, you can see that around the one to three year mark, the Mediterranean diet groups had significantly lower risk of developing cardiovascular disease. After an average follow-up of about five years, both groups assigned to a Mediterranean diet had a significant reduction, about 30% in major cardiovascular events compared to the control group. And you can see on the graph quite clearly the distinction in the two groups. Another research study called the Lion's Heart Study has been done looking at the benefits of Mediterranean diet. And studies to this day continue to show a reduction in mortality from cardiovascular disease. How does a Mediterranean diet compare to a North American diet? It builds on not just specific superfoods, but the benefits of a style of eating, promoting healthy whole grains, as you can see towards the bottom of the triangle, lots of vegetables and fruit, 
in the middle of the triangle, moderate protein, but that protein coming as fish and seafood more often, beans and lentils, limited as we move up the pyramid in higher fat meats and particularly more limited in sweets. The bottom of the triangle are your everyday foods and that's super. It's important to note that the base or foundation of this style of eating is centered around planning meals, eating with family, friends and supports, and of course, being more physically active. Just as an observation, my dietitian colleagues and I have noticed during COVID and over the last about seven months, many of our clients are eating more home cooked meals, less takeout, less fast food, less restaurant meals. And for many, they have seen help in both weight management, diabetes and blood sugar levels. That tells us something. Another style or pattern of eating that's been proven to have health benefits is called the DASH dietary approach. And this stands for dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Along with diabetes, we know that hypertension or high blood pressure is often an issue. I looked for this at a recent study published in Advances in Nutrition, which is an international review journal. And they published a paper in April, 2020. So just recently, dietary approaches to stop hypertension diet and blood pressure reduction in adults with and without hypertension. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control trials. That means they looked at many studies and the outcome. The purpose of this study was to comprehensively assess the DASH diet effects on blood pressure in adults with and without hypertension. The conclusion was that even a modest adherence to the DASH style of eating was associated with a lower risk of mortality. Higher adherence to this dietary pattern strengthened the risk reducing association. The adoption of a DASH diet was accompanied by significant blood pressure reductions. A typical North American diet is high in saturated fat, high in glycemic load carbohydrates, and often has many artificial additives hidden in packaged and processed food. The DASH dietary approach originated in the 1990s. In 1992, the National Institute of Health started funding for several research projects to see if specific dietary interventions were useful in treating hypertension. Subjects included in these studies were advised to follow just dietary interventions and not change any other lifestyle modifications. They found that dietary interventions alone were able to improve blood pressure. Based on these results, DASH has been advocated as first line therapy for people with high blood pressure, along, of course, with lifestyle modification. DASH promotes the consumption of vegetables and fruit, lean meat and dairy products. It also promotes the reduction of sodium in the diet. Emphasis is placed on increasing the consumption of fresh food. This leads, of course, to eating lower fat, sugars, sodium, and additives. As you can see, the DASH dietary approach has many similarities to a Mediterranean style of eating and many other dietary patterns that are promoted for cardiovascular health. The DASH dietary approach requires no special food, but rather provides daily and weekly nutritional goals. Vegetables, aiming for five or more servings daily. Fruit, three to four servings a day. With diabetes, we wanna make sure to spread out those fruit servings. Carbohydrates, we wanna be choosing more whole grains, beans and lentils or legumes. Low fat dairy, this doesn't necessarily have to be fat free, but lower fat and encouraging two to three servings a day. 
lean meats daily focusing on fish and lean proteins, nuts and seeds, two to three servings a week. Healthy carbohydrates include things like whole grains, cracked wheat, quinoa, millet, oats, beans and lentils. Several studies have shown that the DASH diet not only helps with lowering blood pressure, but helps with lowering blood sugar levels, triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, and helps reduce insulin resistance. Based on what we've learned from the research on Mediterranean style of eating and DASH dietary approach, I hope we can all agree that rather than looking for superfoods, we might look as a healthier approach. We want to be looking for a super guide with superfood groups to eat daily, as well as looking at a pattern of eating. And you can see this is the recommendations by the new Canada's food guide. And I called it the super food guide. Many foods, not just the 14 listed in Dr. Pratt's book, are are packed with nutrients and when added to healthy balanced meals or used as snacks can further enhance healthy eating patterns. So remember, choose a variety of fruits and vegetables daily. Choose more whole grains, add low fat proteins such as fish, poultry, lentils and tofu. Drink water daily, add low fat dairy daily or weekly, limit higher fat red meats to weekly or monthly, and limit sweets and snack foods to weekly or monthly. Let's focus on a super plate rather than one measly food. In summary, to bring it all together, it's about eating a wide variety of quality foods, not just one particular food for a particular nutrient. And I just thought I'd bring up two little comics that I thought summarized my talk well. I like to refer to the one on the right, or the colored one first, that says, forget the nutritious superfoods. We can't afford to live that long. But I really like this one. Why, of course I like kale. It's the color of money. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jill, for a very uh, uh, informative presentation and fun presentation around, I, I think, helping us clear the uh, clear up some of the, um, I, I guess, the the misconceptions around superfoods and, you know, how we should look at them. And also maybe trying to, to cut away some of the, the din or the you know, get us through some of the weeds of some of the clever marketing campaigns that um, you know, might lead us astray when we're trying to make healthy food choices and really focusing on, you know, just, um, you know, eating patterns and, and, and maybe choosing foods that maybe would be kind of consistent with say the Mediterranean diet or, or DASH diet and, and really looking at Canada's food guide as a nice um, example of a way to balance out um, our, our dietary patterns so that, you know, as you said, it's not just the 14 foods, but it's really the, uh, the, the broader picture and how we, and really how we, how we eat and when we eat and who we eat with and what we buy. So, so thank you very much. Uh, very informative. At this time, I'd, I'd like just to remind people, we are getting some questions coming through on our, uh, I guess our webinar chat box. So feel free to, um, you know, to uh, enter your questions. And as I said, we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end of the presentations here. Um, and we will do our best to, uh, to, to really um, get to all of them. Um, and I'll also try and distribute the questions a little bit so that uh, there, there are certain questions that are maybe have a bit more of a, say, a, a, a very specific medical focus. Some are more uh, focused around diet um, or medications. And so we'll try and uh, distribute the questions to the different speakers as well, although they'll all have opportunities to contribute um, as they see fit. Um, so last but not least, um, I have the, uh, the privilege of um, welcoming Dr. Jeremy Gilbert uh, to the speaker series here. Dr. Gilbert is an endocrinologist um, here at Sunnybrook. 
and his talk will be on, he'll be discussing really managing diabetes during uh, uh, COVID-19, so very timely. Um, and so we welcome him. Dr. Gilbert, the virtual mic is yours. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Walter. I just wanna make sure everybody can hear me, which is good. I see the, the microphone is off, so we're good to go and my slides are available, which is good to go. So um, first of all, what a privilege it is to uh, be asked to speak at the speaker series and Lee and Jill, we've done this before and we're, we make quite the team. So um, thank you very much for including me with your great talks. Uh, always hard to follow you guys because you're so good at what you do. Um, but I was asked, and so here I am, to talk about diabetes during COVID-19. Certainly, as Walter said, is a challenge. Um, I'd like to put just through my disclosures, I do work with a variety of industry partners for education. It really doesn't have much to do with this talk, but uh, those are the disclosures. And what I hoped to, uh, to accomplish by the end of my, my discussion is to consider whether the presence of diabetes actually increases the risk for acquiring COVID-19 or whether and or whether it makes it actually more worse. So if somebody has diabetes, is the COVID-19 a more worse course? And we'll talk about some of the me medications around people with diabetes and COVID-19 and um, some of the practical aspects. As I know many of the listeners this evening uh, have diabetes or support family members and friends of uh, people with diabetes, and we can get um, some of the practical aspects done. I, I did want to acknowledge uh, one of my other colleagues who I work with, Lori Sutton, who works at Diabetes Care Connect in Toronto, uh, who uh, we've done uh, similar talks before for the uh, greater Toronto community on diabetes, and um, she helped me put some of this talk together and just wanted to thank her for, for her help as well. So the first question is, is diabetes a risk factor for getting COVID-19? So this data comes from the United States and it was based on an analysis of 74,439 case reports of COVID-19 from February to March. And it showed that the prevalence of diabetes in those with COVID-19 was about 10%, where the national presence of diabetes was, was about 10%, suggesting that actually having diabetes does not increase the risk of acquiring COVID-19. So that would tell me that if I was asked if a patient has diabetes and they were saying, you know, I wonder if I'm more at risk of getting it. Well, this data would say that you're probably no higher risk of actually getting COVID-19. However, the severity that one might experience if you have diabetes, as you can see on the far right, those are the comorbidities. So comorbidities, which includes diabetes, tends to give you a more severe course of COVID-19 than if you did not have comorbidities as well. If your age is over 65, you tended to have a more severe course than if you were in a younger age cohort. So what I could thereby answer is that it seems that having diabetes and certainly being older may give you a higher chance, should you get COVID, of having a more, se more severe course. It seems that diabetes in China data is an independent risk factor for more severe COVID-19, like I just showed you before. And that odds ratio is about a 2.47 fold overall. So about 2.5 times, 2.45 fold higher increase of having a more severe course of COVID-19 in one who has diabetes compared to one who does not have diabetes. Some of the other comorbidities that we've seen that contribute to more fatal cases of COVID-19 in addition to diabetes include older age, as you can see here. So those are people over the age of 70 or 80 have a higher risk. Those with cardiovascular disease or showed you diabetes. And interesting, even when you look at people who have chronic lung conditions, actually diabetes is a higher risk for fatality with COVID than actually is somebody who has chronic respiratory disease. Other conditions include high blood pressure and cancer. And this is based upon 
China, China data, and similar data has been shown in North America as well. Now, if we accept the fact that having diabetes doesn't increase the risk, but having diabetes makes perhaps the case more severe, what can you do about it? Now, this data is, comes back to Toronto because SARS was a big deal back in 2003. And we learned from SARS that people had higher survival rates if they had lower fasting plasma sugars compared to people who had higher sugars. If you had higher sugars, your survival was lower than if you had lower sugars. So what this tells us is that if you can control your diabetes and have better sugar control, you're less likely to have a fatal case from SARS. And interesting, as SARS is related to COVID-19, they're similar in virus type. And this data has been confirmed again with COVID-19, where you can see that the survival is highest in those with well-controlled diabetes, seen over here at the top, compared to those with poorly controlled diabetes seen down below. So I feel what this means is that we have an opportunity in the disaster that is COVID-19 to appreciate the value of getting better glycemic control if one has diabetes. Not only does that help re reduce complication diabetes, and as Lee was saying, make a person happier and have a better, Kind of quality of life, but also should one get COVID-19 would improve the odds of survival. Some people say, well, I wonder if you have diabetes, if you present differently, do you still have the fever and the cough and the nausea and so forth? If you look here at the p-values on the right, you're looking for a number under 0.05 is there are no p-values that are under that. It suggests that people with diabetes present very similarly with COVID-19 as people without diabetes. So there doesn't appear to be any difference in that regard. So in terms of practical issues, we appreciate that during COVID-19, we want to try and minimize our contacts with others to reduce the risk of acquiring the virus. Not because you're at a higher risk with diabetes, but should you get it, the course could be more severe. So medical appointments, if it can be done virtually, would be advantageous. Grocery and medication deliveries should be minimized uh, in terms of going in person. And having a, an appropriate and helpful support network is critical, although not always possible. Maintaining good glycemic control is important, as I showed you in this data, showing that people who had better glycemic control had better results from their COVID-19. And people with additional comorbidities, not only just diabetes, but also who have maybe heart or kidney issues as well, need special care and may require more attention from healthcare professionals. And finally, attention to lifestyle factors is important. So Jill spoke to us about having a kind of a diet, not for a specific superfood, but whole, having kind of that whole kind of holistic concept of appropriate kind of uh, incorporation of nutrition in our lifestyle and having more of a food approach uh, that is important. And nutritional deficiencies must be uh, addressed. Um, it may be harder to access certain foods in the pandemic, but we know which foods are good for us and should be those daily foods. We try, want to try and continue with that approach. And exercise is important. So the gyms may be closed. So we have to kind of be creative in our exercise. So walking the hallways, going up and down stairs, um, as certainly as the weather gets cooler, we have to try and continue with those lifestyle and behavior choices. So some of the considerations that we have with diabetes management is to say that COVID-19 doesn't increase the risk, but does increase the risk should one get affected of having a more severe course or fatality. As well, we want to reiterate the importance of sick day management. That means that if a person should get sick with a flu or get volume depleted, there are certain medications listed here that we want to stop. If you're not sure what those medications are, speak to your healthcare provider to try and understand which medications need to be held in the context of other illnesses and dehydration. 
Now, one of the issues we saw with COVID-19 and certainly initially was with toilet paper and hoarding and all that. So the pharmacists initially said, we're only gonna allow you to take 30 days. Now they've loosened that, but Diabetes Canada is recommending that you do have a little bit of extra supplies on hand should you need it, but certainly not to be taking too much um, medications and hoarding that as that will not be advantageous or useful. With respect to very specific medications, these include ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, NSAIDs, low-dose aspirin. The general advice is that we don't have a compelling reason with COVID-19 to initiate or to stop any of these medications. So because of the pandemic that's out there, one should not change their usual approach with these medications. On a personal note, I've noted that food security is an issue. So we know that people with diabetes need to access certain foods. Food banks provide certain types of foods for people, but of course food banks had to close or you couldn't access them as the threat of um, bringing people together in a food bank situation increased uh, concern. So there are uh, centers and there are resources that are available. The other issue that I think is kind of we, we understand, but maybe aren't addressing head on is the issue of mental health and diabetes. And I think Lee addressed that very nicely in her um, talk about happiness and diabetes. But I, I have found that there is a lot more depression, anxiety. Certainly the US election did not help matters with this. And um, we do have to appreciate that mental health and diabetes go hand in hand. Uh, the Canadian Journal of Diabetes has put out some articles on that for healthcare professionals. And I think speaking to people with diabetes and their support uh, network is really important during this time. Now, because people are not always coming in to see me in a healthcare, you know, come, coming to see the doctor and we're doing phones by, we're doing visits by phone or virtually through the Ontario Telehealth Network or Zoom Healthcare or other systems, it's important to note that uh, there is a duty amongst a physician to discuss confidentiality and privacy and to have people informed that virtual care, uh, people should consent to that, that, that they are allowing this to be done virtually. And I think it could be advantageous, but I think it's really important that it be documented and that consent is provided. And so it's really important that the visit that we have with people with diabetes be done with preparation in advance. So it's important that, uh, you know, as patients, that you provide your OHIP card to the office, an up-to-date phone number, uh, the list of current medications and doses, and this will make visits more efficient and more effective for you and for the healthcare provider. As well, you're probably going to need to renew medication, so make sure that the pharmacy information is updated. It's the one that you're using. Provide consent for the virtual visit if you do agree with that. And email consent is sometimes being used as well to assist with communication and emailing lab work requisitions and other information. Provide the best route of communication by home, cell, email, what have you. And find some way to share your sugars with the physician if that's what you do. So whether that means you photo uh, take a photo with your phone of the logbook and send that through, or use glucometer uh, systems that allow you to share values, or the Libre view with the Libre, or Clarity with Dexcom. Some sort of system of sharing sugars can be very helpful in advance of appointments. Now, we want to allow our clients and our patients to be supported, but we also don't want to necessarily have people coming in to hospitals and clinics and creating undue risk. So if you can share those glucose values virtually with technology, that can be really helpful. And um, I have found that some of the advantages also is people really like the value of not having to commute to these visits with the doctor. They're missing less time from work and school. They don't have to pay for parking. So I think that the virtual visits can be leveraged and it can allow for a great opportunity for communication. I found I've had less no-shows. People are available more likely by phone. I can answer questions briefly, at just a quick phone call, as opposed to the whole effort of coming in for a short visit. And it gives you a chance to do more than just have a conversation. I Sometimes with, with videos, I can actually see what, what their home looks like, which I never knew before, and, and how they're coping at home. Um, 
and I think even we can look at some kind of creative strategies, you know, like our, our speaker series is being recorded. Well, what if we recorded the visit and then the patient had the opportunity to hear it back and kind of review what was said? Uh, sometimes we, they don't remember everything that was said at all at a doctor's visit. And wouldn't that be nice for, for the patient and their, and their support network? However, there are challenges with virtual care. Not all people have these fancy devices uh, or the data to share. And not everybody is technologically equipped or have the, has the medical literacy to participate in these visits. Now, sometimes a phone visit can be easier and that may help. Um, and sometimes um, it's useful to arrange an appointment when someone will be there with the patient to kind of help them with the technology. So I think some of the barriers can be overcome, but we need to acknowledge those barriers. The OTN system, if, you're de if your visit is delayed, then it shuts it down. So we need kind of to acknowledge that sometimes the timing may be difficult to kind of connect with the person and the physician in the virtual system. The other thing is for things like insulin starts or injectable therapies, sometimes that's difficult to teach when you're not actually with the person. I found certain PDF handouts that you can email to people and videos online and through YouTube can be very helpful in that regard. Now, the other thing is maybe the patient or the client is comfortable with the virtual platform, but not all healthcare providers are comfortable with this. So we have to acknowledge it's kind of work on both sides and providing access to data can be limited. I mean, I think a lot of people are, have some reservations about going to labs and getting that done or using software that allows you to share the sugars easily. Now, I feel first of all, that lab work is not always necessary with every visit, but prolonged delays in blood work can actually lead to problems. For example, we might miss certain conditions. What if a kidney problem or liver problem came up, we didn't know about it, or a already pre-existing condition worsens, we wouldn't know if we don't have that blood work. And the blood work is helpful to know whether pharmacotherapy medications need to be changed or not. So I now am pleased that most labs in the city um, and Ontario have, you know, very good safety protocols. And I think the opportunity to get blood work now is, is getting better and safer, and that can really enhance the visit with the physician and the healthcare providers. So I think the EMR that I have, um, you know, my chart through Sunnybrook allows people to use technology to their advantage to have more effective and efficient visits and really uh, empower people with diabetes to actually uh, help themselves in, in managing this chronic condition. I also want to acknowledge the value of having an excellent administrative assistant who is comfortable and able to provide proper advice regarding these new devices and techniques. Ultimately, clear communication is really important. So we have Jill and Lee and Walter here. The, you know, clear communication amongst us. And of course, with the center being around the patient and their support system is really, is really, really critical to uh, a good healthcare visit. So just on that kind of note, step one, often the dietitian or the diabetes nurse like Jill and Lee will call patients in advance of their appointment with me. And sometimes they'll email or call me about important aspects of that phone call that I need to address uh, and follow up with. And then I can review that to have a discussion and kind of confirm the plan. And then I'll send my note to the relevant physicians and of course to the Diabetes Education Center as well. And it's really important that's the system we have, but that's not necessarily the correct system. Whatever system you use is fine, but you wanna have consensus amongst all the stakeholders, of course, with the patient being at the center uh, to have a coordinated communication plan uh, in the midst of this pandemic. Now, there are options. So if you don't want to share by email or by LibreView or, or whatever, Verbally sharing the results are good too, um, but you wanna have the relevant information in hand. Downloading meter and providing that can be helpful. Even I found a lot of success with people just taking a picture of their logbook and sending that along. The newer kind of platforms and technology has been great, but acknowledging that not everybody knows how to use them and not all providers are comfortable with them, but working with your institution to kind of help can, you know, can be very, very advantageous to effective visits. And one of the things that often comes up for discussion is, well, how can you do a physical exam uh, when the 
person is not there. But the reality is that you can actually learn a lot remotely. First of all, people can weigh themselves at home and have that avail available. So when I call them up and say, what was your weight? A lot of people have blood pressure monitors at home and, they, and they're great and you can order them online or through your pharmacy. And in fact, there may even be more accurate at home than they are when you come into the hospital and have more stress and the blood pressure is high. And what about the foot exam? So the foot exam is very important. OTN, which is the Ontario Tele Network, allows visual assessment. So you can actually look at the feet. But ultimately, this is an opportunity to talk about foot care and educate people about looking at their feet, what to look for, and having a discussion around the foot exam. And sometimes, despite COVID, it is still necessary to bring people in to look at the feet, to start insulin, or what have you, and that's okay but you don't want to be doing that all the time for every person as that poses unnecessary risk to the patient and to the healthcare team. I wanted to just mention wellness because I think um, Lee really spoke nicely about the happiness of the patient, but I also wanna talk about the wellness of the healthcare provider. You know, I have found now I'm sitting in front of this computer for hours a day and I have to remind myself, I need to get up, stretch, move around, I'm not used to being on the phone so much. I need to take those walks, get outdoors for a few minutes. And, and you know, I think that we all, whether you're listening to me or you're a healthcare provider or whoever you are, if you are having wellness issues, you need to talk to that about somebody um, and, and acknowledge that. And finally, I think it's really important to thank people. And whether that be the patient, their supports, your admin staff, the nurse, the dietitian, the pharmacist, um, the speaker series organizers, whoever, whoever it is, they need to hear it. When you thank people and you, and you create that positive morale and that positive environment, uh, chronic disease management improves. So to summary, summarize, I think having diabetes does not necessarily appear, in, appear to increase the risk for getting COVID-19, but it's one of those comorbidities that has shown in many studies to make the clinical course of having COVID-19 more severe. And so therefore, People with diabetes need to be aware that should they get COVID, it could be worse. And the importance of glycemic control and controlling the diabetes is ever more important. It's important to follow health and safety protocols. And it's important at the same time to address chronic medical conditions. So some people said, well, I'm not gonna do blood work. I'm not gonna to speak to my doctors. I'm not gonna do anything. I'm so scared. Well, that can also lead to detrimental health results if you have chronic medical conditions. And it's important to realize this is challenging and that our care for diabetes may need to be altered, but this new model of care can offer several advantages too. Now there are disadvantages and barriers and we talked about some of those and there are numerous resources available to assist healthcare providers and patients. I refer you to Diabetes Canada, Diabetes Care Connect as great resources um, to help people who are living with diabetes to manage during this pandemic. So remember, we're all in this together. Thank you for listening and stay safe. I'll, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it back to Walter. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, um, for a very informative uh, presentation. We're really looking at the implications of um, really having diabetes. Um, and 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 COVID in this in this climate of, of COVID nineteen and the potential implications um, of I guess the the, the two of them um, merging together if you were to have both um, and really I think and and looking at um, I guess the benefits of uh, proper blood sugar control and how tight or tighter blood sugar control can not only reduce the risk of complications of diabetes in general, but more specifically, uh, maybe the complications and sometimes severe complications of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that, that, you know, all of us, and, and of course I'm looking at Lee and I'm looking at Jill and Dr. Gilbert and I, you know, and I'm down here at the family health team as well. And, 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 and a good portion of the talk too is about virtual care and really the, I guess the benefits of virtual care during this, during this kind of pandemic, these challenging times, the benefits and some of the challenges too, not only for patients, but also for staff members. And I think, you know, looking at the screen here with our team, really, I, I think it's been a learning curve for some patients and for some 
staff members as well. And I think we've been we've been putting virtual care together, both um, individual patient visits, but also group programs uh, together since probably the beginning of March, when really a lot of this, a lot of the, um, uh, I guess, I guess the, the the pandemic came to light and how we had to change our care approaches. So, um, so there's been a learning curve, you know. But as Dr. Gilbert said, really there are um, there are a lot of actually we've learned that there are a lot of benefits that um, that for in many circumstances a virtual care approach can really help and actually be the most practical um, and the most efficient, uh, while recognizing the fact that sometimes office visits are still required. And so I think what we've learned too is that at some point, if we get on the other side of this pandemic, that really, you know, some of these aspects of care, virtual care, will probably stay with us because, you, you know, I think patients actually have, have, have felt that it's been beneficial and, and healthcare professionals have as well. So, so really, um, thank you, Dr. Gilbert, for just really a comprehensive uh, discussion about all of these topics, you know, so timely. Um, I want to say too that you know we uh, although um, Dr. Gilbert uh, was our, our last speaker, I did want to mention again that you know I'm looking at our chat box and you know we we've had some questions that we you know throughout the uh, the different presentations and I would encourage people again to um, you know to consider putting in your questions and we will do the best our best to have our team uh, try and answer them. Um, so with that being said, I think we'll, we'll open up our question and answer session. Uh, we've, we've had questions that kind of have kind of kind of span the gamut of, uh, you know, diet, medications and medical, but there are a, a number of, uh, I think, medical questions. Um, Dr. Gilbert, I guess we'll, we'll start with you if that's okay. Um, so really one, 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 uh, audience question is that my blood sugar is 8.3 in the morning, but, but better throughout the day. Should I worry? Yeah. So it's a good question. So basically just to summarize, Walter, that question is a higher fasting sugar, but good during the day. And, um, I think that, uh, first of all, I would let, let's say for the sake of argument that the A1C of that individual is pretty good. So we have a pretty good A1C, pretty good sugars during the day, but a high fasting sugar. Usually when that happens, it's worth focusing on the evening before that. So in other words, I wouldn't necessarily say medication changes are necessary given that the sugars are good during the day and hopefully the A1C is in target. But to address the fasting sugar, often this is usually some behavior issues that can be modified the evening before. Um, and maybe Jill and Lee might wanna talk about that. But what I'm getting at is often people may be eating later at night or they may be eating certain foods that raise sugars in the evening or they may have lack of activity after dinner. So the classic, you kind of come home, eat and just collapse on the couch um, can lead to a higher fasting sugar. So what I usually recommend in that situation is try to modify the snack in the evening or reduce the carbs in the evening and to do a little bit more activity after dinner. It doesn't need to be like a whole exercise power, you know, energy, you know, exercise thing after dinner, but even a little bit walk around the block or something like that, five, 10 minutes will actually help with the fasting sugar the next morning. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Um, there's a question, uh, Jill, I was, um, um, I might address this one to you, but of course, once again, all the speakers can 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 also um, contribute as well. Uh, the audience member asks, um, how does a diet of carbs and high fat affect sugar levels? And I guess as a, as a second point, are our fermented carbs better than regular carbs? So Jill, I might just start that one with you, but um, if, if you'd like to maybe have a go with that. So it really depends on not just what you eat, but the quantities and the type of carbohydrates. So carbohydrates can be included. Um, they're a healthy part of diet. They're, they're sort of required by the body. I call them the body's main source of energy, but we also wanna look at the quality of carbohydrates. So we wanna look more as our carbohydrates being more whole grains, more nutrient dense, things like um, healthy carbohydrates are a variety of different fruits, but also, like I said, your whole grains, things like whole, whole grain breads, um, and, uh, whole grains as in quinoa and barley and bulgur, 
um, brown rice. Those are your whole grains and those are the carbohydrates that you want to eat. But probably the most important thing about carbohydrates is the portion. And generally in North America, we tend to have much larger portions of carbohydrate than are really needed. And so really looking at um, modifying the portion of carbohydrate. And just as a general rule, I love to say the size of your fist or a quarter of your plate is a great guide for any type of carbohydrate. So look at what you're eating, how much you're eating, and maybe when or how often you're having those carbohydrates and can you improve the quality of them. In regards to fermented carbohydrates, um, that really comes down to, to um, a little bit about vegetables. It's not really relevant in terms of your starchy foods. They're not really um, fermented. And so it doesn't really play a big role in terms of affecting blood sugars. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll um, that's a wonderful answer. And I think we'll keep the questions. We were getting a few questions now, which is great. Um, I think Lee, maybe I'll, um, I will uh, uh, um, maybe send this next question to you. We, uh, we have an audience uh, member who asks, um, how accurate are Libre sensors on the back of the arm versus a blood test from the finger? Lee, you need to unmute. Lee? I had a great, great talk to myself right there. <laughs> uh, so the Libre device reads differently than the finger pokes. Um, the idea is look, the Libre is looking at trends. It's allowed to be plus or minus 20%. The meters are a little bit more accurate, but they they don't allow you to see the trends of your blood sugars where the Libres do allow you to see the trends in your blood sugars over if you're flashing, if you actually flash your meter uh, um, three times spread out through your day, we can get 24 hours uh, of blood sugars where a meter poke will only allow us to see that time and only really reflects what your blood sugar is at that moment. Yeah, so I'll just expand on what we were saying a little bit more. So the Libre, just so everybody's familiar with it. So this is generally worn on the arm and it's a flash glucose monitoring. So you take your phone to your arm and you can scan it and you see what your sugar is at that moment. And then it gives you a trend arrow and it tells you if your sugar's rising or going down and it shows what your sugar has been for the last eight hours. So as Lee was saying, that gives you a lot of information, but it is measuring the interstitial glucose. So it's measuring the sugar that's in the interstitium. While when you use a blood glucose monitor and you're poking your finger, that's measuring the blood glucose. So it's measuring two different things. It's not that they're inaccurate or wrong. It's measuring two different things. Having said that, the Libre system sometimes does report sugars a little bit lower than expected. And so if a person does get a low blood sugar reading on a Libre, they should double check it with a finger poke just to ensure that it is truly low before they manage it. But both systems have value. It's not one or the other. The Libre in Ontario is covered if you have ODB or ODSP. Um, so that means age over 65 with ODB and on insulin. Um, and so it is advantageous, but it, it, um, it needs to be used in the right context. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert and uh, Lee. Lee, I was wondering if I could, um, uh, not, not to pick on you specifically, but um, I thought maybe we'd, we'd address another question to you, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, we have an audience member who says that my diabetic son is having some difficulties with his feet mostly from being indoors for the last seven months. Can you provide some rem remedies for better foot care uh, while indoors? Um, so I, I think if it's just general foot care, I mean, I think that probably if you're seeing something that you're worried about, it's probably making sure somebody actually sees his feet. Um, I think that general foot care involves, you know, cleaning, washing, moisturizing, but I find that I'd actually probably need to see them or talk with you to sort of get a better idea of what's going on with that. Because if, there, if it's dry skin, that would be probably lotions. It could be that, um, you know, the devices that, what is he wearing on his feet? Um, 
just need a little bit more information. There is part of that question. I'm just wondering if Jeremy can answer is, uh, would you be able to see a podiatrist and would that be on OTN? I yeah. don't know about yeah. that. Yeah, so OTN is stands for Ontario Tele-Network and not every physician is signed up to that, but some are. And basically it's a way of kind of connecting with a, a patient, no matter what the patient medical condition is and uh, it's through a tele-network so there's a video there's a camera with the doctor and then there's a camera with the patient and of course the patient could kind of tilt the camera so that you could see the feet but it still doesn't replace the fact that you actually are touching the feet and seeing the feet in person and I think that if there's a legitimate foot problem in somebody with diabetes that is one of the conditions that probably does warrant a visit to actually see a healthcare provider. And then depending upon, as Lee was saying, what the issue is, then you would refer them to the correct place. So if it's a neuropathy and it's a nerve problem, they may need to see a neurologist. If it's a vascular problem, they need to see a vascular surgeon. Uh, if it's requiring foot care and wound issues and ulcers and that kind of stuff, they may need to see a chiropodist or a podiatrist. So I think it kind of depends. And as Lee was saying, also there's a combination of the actual acute medical issue with the foot, but also highlighting the importance of ongoing foot care for people with diabetes. So that involves daily looking at your feet um, and taking good care of them. So if they're dry, applying the moisturizer, as Lee was saying, um, and examining for any issues. And if there is concern to let the healthcare provider know, and then they can determine uh, the acuity by which it needs to be assessed and how it's best assessed. I would, I would also add, thanks Jeremy for, explaining that. I would also add that if you have questions that we probably need more answers, I have no problem if you call our main line and, and we can have a discussion to see where we can send you or send your son uh, for if, if that is required. So we are available to be able to talk about that. Just to add to that, um, Sundeck, the Diabetes Center at Sunnybrook, takes self-referrals, which means you do not need a doctor to refer you to our program to meet with a nurse and or dietitian. We sometimes do that together. Um, and so anybody also asking questions or would like an individual appointment is welcome to call our main office um, and most likely leave a message. And at this point in time, we're doing mostly phone appointments, but again, may be able to um, address some of these questions individually. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to see if we can link some of the questions together here, or actually sometimes maybe even, even um, cover a little bit different territory as well, because we talked about maybe some of the physical implications with diabetes and foot care and issues around skin care and things like that. But um, Dr. Gilbert, I, I, I want to put this one out to you. Um, it's uh, an audience member, if, if it's okay, an audience member um, remarked that uh, on type three diabetes in quotes, um, uh, and what, and I guess the, the audience member asked about research that's happening regarding insulin resistance in the brain and the possible link to brain degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So maybe that other aspect of uh, diabetes and diabetes care. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. Type three diabetes is uh, uh, you know, a coined term in the literature. Uh, I mean, the original type three diabetes was actually pancreatic and other causes of diabetes. But when, when the uh, audience members referring to this particular, they're talking about kind of a, a less established diabetes Kind of concept of insulin resistance and its effects on the brain and dementia, degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's. This is an area of current research. And I think at this point, we don't have any definitive answers on this particular topic. So, uh, you know, sometimes in medicine, we have to acknowledge when, when we know things and, and there's kind of a clear path and also when we're, we don't know. And so I think there is current research and you know, Sunnybrook is actually known for um, this particular area of neurosciences and um, is kind of a leader actually in looking at effects on sugar along with Baycrest. Uh, Sunnybrook and Baycrest have done some great work on this topic, but we, we don't have an answer here. Um, so in the absence of an answer, we do know that 
insulin resistance and high sugars do lead to complications. So we know that people with diabetes, for example, have higher rates of stroke, three to four fold higher rates of stroke and stroke is a condition of the brain. So indirectly, I could say that having good glycemic control is good for the brain, but I can't necessarily comment on the concept of degenerative di diseases like Alzheimer's in that regard. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. I know that that, that question does come up with, with some of our patients because sometimes I guess it's, it's you know, when we see the, phys the, the actual physical effects of um, maybe poor blood glucose control, say on our, on our, on our bodies, so whether it's foot care or skin care, but I know this is a far more, um, I, I, maybe it's more something a little bit more, um, it's a bit more of a black box or a harder thing to relate to because I know that some, some of our patients even really, they say, well, my blood sugars are high, but I'm not worried about it. I'm not having any, I'm not having any real problems or complications. At, yeah, at so really I, Walter, I mean, I think, and, and Lee, Lee's actually one of the, you know, Ontario best at kind of at that, Kind of addressing that particular concept, um, you know, when people have a have a condition of chronic diseases like diabetes, there's a lot of emotion that's involved with this, and people go through different phases, just like grieving, you know, um, and people often will have guilt and they feel like they're they're at fault. Well, first of all, they should know that their pancreas, of no fault of their own, is not making enough insulin, and there may be some genetic component. Now there is some things that they could do, right? So Jill spoke nicely about some of the better food choices that they can make. Um, but there, people with diabetes don't always necessarily feel bad. They may have high sugars or A1C might be elevated and they feel pretty good. And so they may say, why is this important? So as educators, it's our job to make people understand why diabetes is important. And maybe it's not important that they feel fine, but maybe they have a grandchild or they have a cottage or they have something that matters to them. Um, and, uh, and having a better quality of life with, with diabetes control can actually be, you know, if they empower themselves rather than the healthcare provider kind of empowering them, uh, that often leads to better results. Well said, Dr. Gilbert. Yeah. Um... You know, I so there's a question here that I think comes up now. Of course, this is my first uh, uh, speaker series, but uh, this question I, I I believe comes up most times, and I'm gonna actually turn. I'm gonna ask Jill to try and answer this question, but of course, everyone once again can answer. Um, and let me just see. I just oh, here we are now. Um, so an audience member asks, "How safe are artificial artificial sweeteners?" Um, can you touch on sweeteners like aspartame versus natural sweeteners like stevia? Um, uh, sorry, the questions are coming in here. So can you, can you touch on art artificial sweeteners and, and maybe your thoughts on that and safety and, and use of same? Okay, so yes, this question does come up often. So as far, again, as far as we know in the research uh, up to this point says that artificial sweeteners are safe to use when used in moderation and studies, many studies have been done and there are some few studies that come out with some negative results, but you have to look at the number of people that these, that these negative studies are done on and the quantity of artificial sweetener used. The government of Canada or Health Canada continues to say that the use of artificial sweeteners like aspartame um, or Splenda, which is another artificial sweetener, um, that these sweeteners when used in moderation are safe to use. And moderation is quite generous. It really depends on an individual height and weight and the particular sweetener, but in general, um, it's very generous. It's like eight cans of diet pop a day or, so if you use a packet of artificial sweetener in a coffee or tea, one or two in a day, or if you have a yogurt that uses artificial sweetener, there is no evidence to show that they're harmful. Of course, using artificial sweeteners, though, is always up to individual discretion. So if you're somebody who doesn't, who doesn't like what they've read or heard or the taste, there's no reason why somebody with diabetes has to use artificial sweeteners. And so there are many other ways to include food in a healthy way or different types of maybe, quote, natural sweeteners. The stevia is interesting. It's considered a natural sweetener because it comes from a plant. So it's not artificial but it's really quite processed. When you add stevia to a food, it's quote, a natural sweetener, but you don't add it in the form of a leaf. 
you add it in the form of powder and it's a very, very tiny amount of powder. So it's somewhat processed and the amount of powder or stevia that you're getting is so small that it doesn't contribute anything to the diet. That's why it's considered to be a non quote, non nutritive natural sweetener, but it is somewhat processed. So the difference between processed and artificial and where's natural, it all becomes a little bit blurred. Um, it is an alternative and you're welcome to use that as well. It really becomes an individual preference. So all Jill, from a health perspective are safe to use. Jill, can you clarify for me on that topic also? As I think in terms of natural, the two most common places that I see this is in regular soda versus diet soda. People don't wanna give up that soda. Um, are you comfortable with people having diet soda over regular soda with diabetes? And the other where I see this is in the coffee and tea. I had two patients today call me that they're putting two packets of sugar into the tea and the coffee uh, with diabetes. And I suggested the artificial sweetener if they insist. What, could you just comment on those specific cases? Sure, sure. So in terms of diet, diet soda comes with aspartame. It can come with, with stevia. It really depends on the company. One is not better than the other. It, because I, I can't comment. I think that has to do with individual taste, individual preference. According to Health Canada, they're both safe. If you have diabetes, I would definitely recommend a diet soda as opposed to a regular because a regular is going to have loads of non-nutritional calories and carbohydrate, which is going to contribute to huge fluctuations in blood sugar. So whether it comes from stevia or whether it comes from a quote artificial sweetener, that's really comes down to people's taste and preference. Um, as long as it's diet and what you're looking for is on the nutrition label, like Coke Zero or whatever, is carbohydrate zero. You want it to be zero, zero calories. It's going to not affect the blood sugar at all. In terms of adding, quote, a natural sweetener like sugar to coffee, tea, regular pop, it really depends on the quantity. So if you're adding two, three spoons, packets, and you're drinking coffee regularly, we don't want to recommend that. Adding extra sugar, we don't realize how much sort of hidden processed, quote, added sugars we get. I'd much rather people eat healthy quality carbohydrates than added in a form like added sugar. We don't realize how much hidden of that stuff we get in our diets in a general basis. So we really don't recommend it because it doesn't add any nutritional value and let it does add potential for larger fluctuations in blood sugar. So if we take it away from the beverage perspective, we can um, much get a much better perspective on food and portions. But if someone truly is having, blood sugar levels are well controlled, so we wanna start at the baseline, and they're having very small amounts of quote natural sweetener, like a half a teaspoon measured, not perception of teaspoon of a little bit of sugar or a little bit of honey in one cup of tea, that is not going to throw blood sugars off. But most people don't look at measured quantities and frequency and which adds up in the overall um, end of the day. So again, this is something that we work with individuals on based on where they're at. If you're not comfortable using any artificial sweetener or switching to stevia, then we really want to look at what are your natural sources of sweetener? How much are you having? When are you having it? And that really needs to be guided by um, a dietitian or diabetes educator. Does that address your issues? That, thanks for that comprehensive answer. So I know, because I know it comes up, right? it, it comes up, um, I think, frequently. So that was a, because um, I, I, I think it goes back to the, um, not that, not that sweeteners are superfoods because they most certainly are not, but I, I think just the information out there that's produced by, you know, different companies or, you know, different, um, it, it's hard to, to, to really understand, you know, you know, what is the best, what's the healthiest way to use these products, I guess is what we're saying. So, um, okay, well, moving on. So we just got a few more questions here, but um, there, there was a question that's actually, it was addressed to Dr. Gilbert, but I think this is, to be really um, out to the group as well too. It's it's a basically is recommending what type of blood glucose meter should I use? Um, I suspect it won't just be a simple uh, 
a simple answer, but it could be, I guess. Um, I'll leave that to the experts. Um, and the, the, the audience member mentions Dexcom as one of them. Okay, so, so Lee, I'm gonna start and then you're gonna finish. Okay, ready? <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> okay, so there's different ways of monitoring glucose. So there's glucose meters, well, that was a topic we just talked about before. Then we talked about flash glucose monitoring. That was the Libre that we talked about. Dexcom is a different type of system. It's a continuous glucose monitor, kind of similar to the Libre in the sense that it tells you what your sugar is, but it also gives you alarms and the trends and so forth. Um, but uh, Dexcom is not covered and um, unless you have a private drug plan. And usually Dexcom is more reserved for type one diabetes, generally speaking, with some exceptions. Uh, and pregnancy is a whole different topic that we can get to later. In terms of um, which glucose meter we recommend. So what we wanna do is try and find a glucose meter that has some of the features that the patient may like, like whether it has a USB port or Bluetooth capabilities. And as well, you wanna use one that has more internal accuracy. So Health Canada will not allow certain meters to come to market if it's not accurate enough. But even with the ones that are in market, they do vary. And I tend not to tell my patients which one to use specifically. And I have people like Lee who helps me. So Lee, which one would you recommend? Um, well, I think, I think it comes down to individuality and what you're looking for. Like, do we need a bigger screen? Do you like the idea of an app? Most of them actually have apps now, so they can actually be wired into your phone. Um, some of them you can actually even share your data with other people. Um, and that just goes for the meters. Um, some of them, it comes down to the color for different uh, vision issues can be the color of the strip that one is easier to see, one is easier to maneuver in. So we take into account a lot of things around, does a person have arthritis? Would, is this easy to open? We're looking at a lot of different. So I am actually of the same mind. I don't necessarily pick one for anybody. I sort of talk with them to find a little bit more out about you and then sort of look at what the options are. But know that you're never stuck with one meter. As soon as you go back into a pharmacy and you purchase 100 strips, you can get a different meter. So it, you're not stuck with this, type, this meter for the rest of the time. So you might find that you hear about something or see something that might work better. The Dexcom and the Libre are the sensors. So they're a different kettle fish. And also, as Jeremy mentioned, it's the cost factor um, that they uh, usually, if you have third party coverage, Libre does have some breaks in there with ODSP and so does Dexcom. But Dexcom is, a, as Jeremy recommended, is more related to type ones, but there are some type twos and it's an individual. It pushes the data out. So it actually pushes the data to your phone and alarms where with the Libre, you actually have to flash with your phone or the device to actually get the blood sugar reading. So those are the differences in a nutshell. Jill, do you have anything to add? <laughs> um. I find it's a really big individual preference. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I think the newer technology, the Libre and what's called the Dexcom or continuous glucose monitoring systems are great. But for many people, they're almost too much information. So it really depends where you're at with your diabetes. There's no point in going on these fancy systems if one, they're not being used properly. And we're finding that a lot with the Libre, they're not being used properly. Um, and so it's really good to work with a healthcare team um, or your doctors to make sure that you're getting the most out of whichever system you use. And certainly a meter um, pricking your finger can work just as well. So I agree with Jill and Lee. Um, I would say that in my own practice, though, the uptake of uh, Dexcom and Libre has been substantial and has been game changing. So um, it, I think what Jill's highlighting is that it needs to be for the right person at the right time, which is definitely true. Um, but for the right person at the right time, it is an absolutely essential, amazing tool because it does give you your sugar every five minutes and which way it's going. So you can make in real time, you can make decisions 
on, on your glucose and your diabetes. And, and I think that that can be very helpful for people, but you're right. It has to be used at the right person at the right time and, and kind of ha appreciate the advantages and disadvantages and use it as a tool um, properly. Not only is it a game changer, sorry, Lee, not only is it a game changer for the patient, but for us as healthcare professionals and being able to see and help people, it's just been hugely um, advantageous for all of us. I, I would say the only other thing I would add is, is making sure you're getting the full potential out of the device you're using. Like what does it, what can it offer you? And some of them it's, that's where the Libre can give you so much more than just your fasting blood sugar in the morning. And I think that's what Jill was speaking to is learning how to use it to get the most out of it. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're getting closer to the end of our uh, question and answer period and the end of our time. Um, I, I do want to see if we can maybe just just kind of squeeze out a couple more um, uh, questions. Um, and, uh, but, and I want to thank the audience for, you, you know, I've, I've had a st steady stream of questions come through here. So I want to thank everyone for uh, providing their questions to us. I think, um, um, I don't want to, there was a question really, one of the first ones that came in, um, and I don't want to put Dr. Gilbert on the spot and he can, you know, it, this may be beyond even the scope of this particular question, but uh, Dr. Gilbert, we'll have a go with this. Um, uh, should so, so an audience member asked, should someone who became pre-diabetic after developing subclinical Cushing syndrome try to prevent diabetes by following a diabetic diet? <laughs> you're, you're, I yeah, think. yeah. So, okay. So, Walter, that's a tougher question, and I, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. So, should someone who becomes pre diabetic after developing subclinical Cushing's try to prevent diabetes by following a diabetic diet? So, following a diabetic diet, as Jill had said, is a lifestyle thing. It's not a, you know, you have to change what you eat completely to address the sugars. It's trying to find a kind of a way of living healthy through nutrition. So I think that would be important whether you had Cushing syndrome or not. The issue is that in people who have Cushing syndrome, which is a high cortisol excess state, which cortisol is a hormone made by the adrenal that can lead to more insulin resistance, one needs to try and address that Cushing syndrome. Where is that coming from and how to treat that? That's probably a medical um, condition that that a person should be seeing an endocrinologist for to address. And because the high cortisol state leads to insulin resistance, it's not a surprise that sugars are high and that gives you a pre-diabetic or diabetic state. So I think that's where that, that's going. And I, I think the approach there is certainly to a kind of have a combination of approaches. So, so behavior approaches, lifestyle modification, proper diet, proper exercise, but appreciating that that's not gonna cure the underlying Cushing syndrome. And therefore that needs to be worked up and investigated by an endocrinologist. And the follow-up question to that is, which type of medications would you use for pregnant women with chronic hypertension during pregnancy? Uh, that was also a little bit of a uh, question, not necessarily diabetes related, but I think it's important to appreciate diabetes in pregnancy as pregnancy can increase uh, the, basically the placenta offers insulin resistance. And so people can be diagnosed with diabetes in pregnancy. And that's a health risk that the health condition that needs to be addressed properly uh, by healthcare professionals that are comfortable in a diabetes and pregnancy kind of clinic and environment. But what I think the question there was getting at was that certain blood pressure medications are not safe in pregnancy. The ones that we typically use in diabetes like ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Um, and so other medications like nifedipine or Adalat and methyldopa have to be used in pregnancy because the other ones are not safe. So my, my just advice there is that you want to speak to somebody who's managing the blood pressure for this person in pregnancy and switching the medications appropriately to the, uh, to the medications that are safe and effective in pregnancy. And then back to the Cushing's, making sure diet, exercise, and that, but recognizing that's not gonna solve the problem, also need the proper workup by the endocrinologist. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, for, for that answer. So, sorry, I didn't mean to wanna put you in the spot on that one, but thank you very much. That was very, very helpful, very informative. Um, we're we're kind of coming to, I guess, the end of our uh, 
program for the evening. Um, I want to thank um, really all of the all of the presenters for um, you know you know um, providing a, you know a lot of helpful for information this evening, and I think very holistic information both in relation to. I mean, managing our, you know, our mental health and our happiness, uh, living with a chronic illness and looking at our diet and looking at really a, a very um, a more kind of a, a, a you, you know, not a, a more of a, um, um, I, I guess, you know, in keeping with the Canada Food Guide, more of a, a systematic approach to our diet and, and, and thinking outside the box. So not just focusing in on specific foods, but, but really looking at food patterns and um, and really cutting through some of the, um, I guess, some of the information out there that may not give us, help us with the best choices and, and really questions, medical questions and questions around, you know, meters and monitoring blood sugar. So really, I think we've kind of spanned the whole uh, gamut of questions this evening and, and, and the presentations really kind of help, I think, draw out some of these questions as well. Um, I think Walter, just, to, yeah, well, we just want to take on behalf of Jill and and Lee, just to take a moment to thank you uh, for moderating. Uh, not an easy job. We're seeing all the questions coming in and three different panelists. So uh, you deserve a lot of credit as well. So thank you for your leadership and moderating this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and, and, and just as, a, as kind of a final housekeeping matter, um, you, you know, we'd like to ask everyone, the audience uh, members, that if you could take a moment to um, fill out the electronic evaluation form, it really will help us plan for uh, future talks and topics that you might be interested in. Um, so if you could take a few minutes to do that, we'd really appreciate it. And I guess once again, I'd like to thank all of our, um, our speakers this evening for just providing us with a wealth of information. Um, and I want to thank all of our audience members for joining us virtually um, during these challenging times. Um, and I would encourage everyone to please be sure to check out our upcoming topics, um, including a discussion on back health coming up in January. So maybe on that note, uh, on behalf of everyone, I'm, I'll leave it at that. And I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.